Hey guys, I want to talk to you a little bit more about these two witnesses in Revelation. Not a whole lot, but just a little more that I read about last night. And and I'm not unsure, I'm kind of unsure about the the comparison of these two olive trees, where it's mentioned about Zerubbabel and Joshua, and seeing how Zerubbabel was a prince and Joshua was a priest, and so that represents the the kingly and priestly prerogatives of the church. Uh, that's really interesting. I'm not quite sure if that's it or not. I'm not saying that's wrong. But, you know, the olive trees, I've read, like, the olive branch could represent peace and stuff, so... And the candlesticks, you know, light. So it could be, like, the witnesses bring peace and light, or... Um... The olive trees can represent oil, which can represent the Holy Spirit... So, there's lots of different things that I've seen suggested for this stuff, but this isn't really the main point of, the, you know, this isn't what we what really matters so much that somebody understands. Um, but, I want to continue because I realize that I didn't go further into the passages, so I want to go into it a little bit more. And I want to see, show you that there's some parallel passages in Revelation 13 where it mentions the beast. And it's talking about the mark of the beast as well. Like in Revelation 11.5, I went over this, and it says, If any man will hurt them, the two witnesses, fire proceedeth out of their mouth. I talked about how it's not literal, physical fire. And devoureth their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he in this manner must be killed. So that last part there, we can kind of see a parallel passage in Revelation 13. It says, He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. He that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and faith of the saints. And so these parallel passages, this one and another one I'm going to show you, are also kind of proofs to show that these two witnesses represent the saints, okay, or the church. So, if any man hurt them, he must in this manner be killed, okay? Like, as, as he killed them, he will be killed, okay? He that killeth with the sword will be killed by the sword, okay? So we see pretty much the exact same thing said there. And, we go on later on, and this is a, the other thing I want to show you, Revelation 7. And when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them, and shall overcome them, and kill them. Okay. And so, people may say, well, you think the two witnesses are the church? Well, it says that they're overcome, and they're killed. You know, what about the passage where Jesus says that the gates of hell shall not prevail against them or whatever? Okay, well, hold on, because there's a parallel passage in Revelation 13, 7, a parallel verse. It says, And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them, and power was given over, was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. Okay. To overcome them, to overcome them. See, the saints, the two witnesses, they represent the church. Okay. Ah, but, of course, this, um, more could be said about this, but this overcoming of them, uh, is just, it's just temporary. It just seems as though the beast overcomes them. Okay. Um, then we see the, two witnesses resurrected and there's kind of comparisons with um jesus's resurrection there and i want to go more into that not right now um because i still need to look over some things so i'll go over this i'll keep going over this more and more but i'll just share with this a little bit with you as i'm getting it and adding it here also it says when they finish their testimony then the beast comes out of the bottomless pit to make a war against them so we kind of see that, you know, their mission is completed first. Like God protects them um, and they get done what needs to get done. Um, also, somebody made an argument that because the beast makes war with them and they said that war is done with groups. 
okay, not individuals. And if if he, if it was just two individuals, if these two witnesses were really just two individuals, then it wouldn't be right to say that he's going to make war against them because then it would just be a personal assault on two individuals. So, you know, that's not totally the best argument, but, uh, you know, kind of makes sense at the same time. It kind of does. But anyways, I, I can see that, that these two represent the church. Um, I've also found out that there, there's a lot of other interpretations for who the two witnesses are, and I was reading up on them last night, and it looks like the Seventh-day Adventists think that the two witnesses are the Old Testament and the New Testament. And, um, you know, they're described as persons and stuff, and I understand that there's figures of speech and stuff, but it does make more sense to me that they are the saints, especially seeing these parallel passages in Revelation 13 and other reasons. But um, also... Some people have thought that these two witnesses were like reformers, or they were like um, people in the church later on that were going to be like resurrected. And I can't remember, like, I don't know, the Shakers, I guess the Shakers thought maybe there was two specific people that, that they knew that was coming back. And then, of course, a lot of people think Elijah and Moses. The reason why they think that mostly, I think, is because that they're spoken of as having these powers of the plagues and the fire and all that stuff, which Moses and Elijah did, so instantly people think that. But, um, again, that's, that's all symbolic and stuff. Um, so, the, the most important thing for people to get from this is that, you know, two witnesses aren't two specific individuals that are coming in the future. Um, and certainly not Moses and Elijah. So, um, yeah, this is all an allegory, okay? And there's a lot more, there's other, a lot of other people that teach this and stuff, and you can, I'm doing more research on it. I found a PDF that's pretty good. It provides a little bit more. I downloaded it. You can find it on Google. It's the two witnesses of Revelation 11 and the mission of the church. Okay. And uh, it talks about how they are the church. But yeah, you could look that up. It's 11 pages. And there's probably some good stuff in here. The identity of the two witnesses. Okay, and it says here, to begin with, we notice that the two are introduced as if they had been spoken about previous. Previously, let us remark the presence of, yeah, okay, the Greek and the Hebrew doesn't matter, but I will give power to my two witnesses. They shall prophesy 1,260 days clothed in sackcloth. Their identity, therefore, must be sought in the contents of the book itself and not out of its boundaries. The two are firstly identified as witnesses. The idea will be reaffirmed in verse 7. In the rest of the Revelation, the following characters are identified as witnesses. John, Jesus Christ, Antipas, and all those with the blood of whom the great mother of harlots became drunk. Christ and Antipas are presented as paradigmatic witnesses of all Christians about whom the revelation, even though it does not directly identify them as witnesses, tells us that they have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Those the souls of whom have shown themselves under the heavenly altar to the author and his vision are also witnesses because they have slain the word of God and for their testimony which they held. Anyways, I realize this probably isn't getting recorded. I just realized that. This recording the background screen, but I opened up a PDF and uh, let's see. Sorry about that, guys. Let's see what we can do here. No. Uh, 
I guess I can't open it there. Oh my. Okay. Let's see here. Um, what can I do? Let's go to Google. So we go to Google and we type in the two witnesses are the church PDF. Okay, this is what I was reading right here. <laughs> okay, the two witnesses of Revelation 11 and the mission of the church. And then down here, we got the identity. Oh, this was the whole identity of the church, of the two witnesses. Hmm. I'm just going through this real quick, seeing if there's anything that sticks out. The scene of the defeat and resurrection of the two also pleads in favor of identifying the two witnesses with the Christian community. All those that dwell upon the earth, that is, all those who obey Satan and fight against the church rejoice over their death are overcome with fear, seeing their resurrection at the present and their ascension to heaven. Hmm. Anyways, I'm just kind of wasting time here but sorry for the long pauses but that's all i'm going to share today i guess for this for now maybe more later but god bless